Hello everyone, this is CM Kozeman again and that was the theme of the immortal 1976 film Alien which has been on my mind a lot recently rather after watching this one obvious film these dates this is recorded in May 2017 and the film I'm talking about is Ridley Scott's nearly 40 years later sequel or prequel or whatever quill you wanna call it to Alien. The film is Alien Covenant and this has become a kind of a movie review channel now but hey we must do as we must. I'm sorry for not being able to record any more videos in the last two weeks. Things were a bit busy and some minor family health issues but knock on wood nothing bad so you wouldn't be surprised to know that i was a big alien fan i was born in 1984 and the movies were already out when i was a baby and i remember distinctly my father watching Alien 1 and Aliens on a Betamax, not even VHS videotape recorder back in our home. So when I was little in Ankara, that's in Turkey, you couldn't really see blockbusters on the same dates as they would come out in the West or wherever. So you would have to resort, retort to this immense network of pirate video stores which were present in every neighborhood, town or even village. So people got pirate VHS and Betamax videos and when I was little I was... it was like this kind of magic canister and this is like one of the earliest childhood memories I still retain but so you plug this magic canister to this bulky machine and the video player was an arcane model it looked rather like the ship Nostromo in the 1976 Alien so it's like but I was so scared because I saw my father watching these films and it was very scary I remember the space jockey pilot and then in aliens there was a nightmare scene uh, in which Ripley dreams the alien is coming out of her and it would just give me the creeps to such a level that I associated the Betamax player with the alien film and it felt somehow as if alien was inside the tape so that was really a big impact so as we grew up me and my brother i had a brother a few years later me and my brother would make these alien spin-off films of course it was convenient that there were androids in the alien universe and so i was an entire army of memo androids i just kept changing my t-shirts and my brother was this kind of hapless space soldier guy and of course we had no budget for an alien creature so the creature was always realized off camera so like there's like oh what's this oh don't come any closer and then there would be a shot of us splashing milk and uh, torn newspaper pieces and cables to the wall so you would see that the alien is tearing the android apart it was also convenient that in the aliens universe androids have this whitish blood 
so we could use milk and we didn't need to make these expensive and dirty fake blood out of juice and paint or whatever so that was another memory of I should dig these films up they're really hilarious and then we used to play a game called Alien I'm really proud because I invented this game and the game went that one person was the alien and he or she crouched to become the egg so you couldn't really start the game until people came next to you and then you came out and started chasing people it's a bit like tag but if you catch anyone they join you but they don't need to show this right away so if you catch someone away from their friends you could turn him or her and then they would go and it would be very tense like people would say question where were you you were you bitten or whatever and to my credit i remember going around in in our neighborhood like a decade later and a group of kids were still playing alien in the version me and my brother had invented except that now they had come up with another class of player called the professor so and if you were a professor you could change an alien back to a human player or whatever so yeah these were examples of how deep this film left an impact on me and i still think the oldest film is the best followed closely by aliens then i think if you look at the whole saga this recent film is a close turn on the same level with alien 3 which is a severely underrated film in my opinion and then alien resurrection is just crap there beating a dead horse in my opinion and then slightly close to it in the level of crapness perhaps not as crap is prometheus which came out in 2009 and of course i mean prometheus was severely criticized for the lapses of judgment that its characters had so you got this trained alien zoologist and they see a death snake and he's like oh let me pet you and then in another scene these scientists are so overcome with excitement that they're in a kind of fetid alien relic ship and they're like all right i'm gonna take my helmet off i don't care Psst. and then stupid abortion machine just as to like foreign object set gender whatever that was just a really bad weird thing and everybody seemed a bit pointless and silly in the film it wouldn't have disturbed one as much if ridley scott hadn't gone into this extreme and perfectly executed level of detail about the world he was building oh, we all know these are movies and you know you can switch your brain off when you're watching fast and the furious but in prometheus or alien covenant the world building is so detailed i mean the goddamn probe is designed like in this film one of the characters throws a like blinking beacon to signal the other ship whatever and that beacon has been designed with perfect industrial precision so if you didn't have that level of world building it wouldn't be so disturbing but you know when the world is that detailed you expect characters to act smartly at least as smartly as the props are designed but no <clears throat> also i was a bit peeved by uh, prometheus that it seemed to have this kind of pro-religion message with like 
there are things we are not meant to find out and it's good to be ignorant sometimes and it's also pandered to this old chariots of the god uh, mankind has to be created somehow this ancient aliens trope i think in contemporary popular culture prometheus and now alien covenant gave this ancient alien creation myth a shot in the arm at least if you're talking about uh, ancient civilizations aliens creating humans or whatever so about this series a lot of these details the depth of the world building versus the stupidity of the characters and the plot and sometimes the strange messages that came out when you put put and put put two and two together in the plot they had something weird but in this film at least i came to a new realization that uh, kind of allows me to forget these shortcomings and really enjoy these films and that realization is that ridley scott old geezer as he might be is engaging in some sort of cinematic symbolism with these films and he's clearly having a good time now we will get there i'll tell you i'll tell you all about symbolism in art and cinema so on and so forth but let's dig a bit deeper into alien covenant <laughs> Okay, so before going into Alien Covenant, uh, I just had another flashback about a neat memory from my Alien fandom days. Then I'll shut up about it. Uh, so, as I told you, we had this Alien game and it was like super popular with all the kids our age. To such a degree that in 1996, when we first started getting access to the internet... I discovered a website from Hollywood selling an actual replica alien suit from a I like prop shop or something I don't know and my incredibly smart plan was to somehow collect enough money to get this suit which was like $700 or something which is I mean quite a big price especially in 1996 and then for summers we used to go me my brother and some of our family friends we used to go to this out of city place to spend some time by the sea or stuff and my fantasy was getting this crappy alien suit wearing it and wearing it in our holiday home and this is a kind of like middle of nowhere place you know i mean it's a rather rural area not like a city at all so my idea was wearing this suit and like <laughs> going after uh people in a, like the ultimate alien experience and we even said well Dad, if you loaned me the $700 now, I could have people play this game for money because it's going to make it so awesome. And then I reckon in two summers I could make the money back. <laughs> Obviously, the snag was that the company did not ship overseas. So I had no chance of getting the suit anyways. But even if I did, it would be a bit risky because as I thought, this was a bit of a rural place and in the 1990s there was still a severe imbalance in culture and worldview between city dwellers and rural people in Turkey and you know a lot of people around that area it's a bit like Mexico they pack guns and stuff so if they would see this strange thing going in their fields at night. They would probably be like, <laughs> and uh, 
and it would have been a short and messy end. But anyways, that was how simple things once seemed to me and still a ridiculous memory. Maybe I should still do it. Now nobody would shoot it. People have internet everywhere and it's become a much more global world in that respect. But anyways, Alien Covenant. Okay, this film, it's like a series of really beautiful and in certain cases mesmerizing scenes. If any of the main scenes in this film were short films in themselves, they would have been like instant classics or won an award or something. But put them together and as I told you, there's still some inconsistencies and like some really stupid plot holes and uh, like it's like a Frankenstein patched together from various body parts that just don't quite fit. Um, but let's talk about the good bits. Okay, so Michael Fassbender was fascinating as David and Walter. So he plays two androids in one. David is a recurring act from Prometheus and in the last film he was decapitated turns out that the motherly scientist that got to survive at the end of Prometheus like sued him back together and now he's become all like Byron-esque and a kind of like a American's idea of a posh educated Oxbridge twat he's like always quoting poetry and he's like talking like carry on then oh very well how do you do do you want to pl play my flute easy does it I will do the fingering he's this kind of I, I believe nobody in Britain educated or not talks this way it's just such a trope uh, it's also ridiculous that this kind of it ticks every box of a stereotype that was never real but this kind of um, dark semi Tim Burtonian, Tim Burtonian but mostly like Lord Byron or Edgar Allan Poe type dark romantic who hates mankind and he spends all his time sewing up little dead animals and drawing these ugly pictures of insects and he really wants all life to end because he thinks life is flawed but if you just looked back at his history I kid you not he has father issues so the guy who built David Wayland is like you and I are gonna discover the history of our species and our origin. And you can tell that Wayland is this kind of like Kant slash twat. And I know people like this who kind of have made fortunes in real estate or tech or whatever. And they are like obsessed with some self-imposed task that they think will illuminate a lot of humanity's history. But in reality, no one cares about. So in the film, Wayland is super crazy about, oh, I want to discover our ancestors, where we came from, immortality, it's yours. Take it, but uh, he's built David in his own image. Like I don't know how rich this guy is supposed to be, but he's really stupid. Nobody with any kind of sense. Like all the closest I can think in real life is Jeff Bezos. This 
really awful guy who founded Amazon.com and he's infamous for uh, creating cancerous levels of workplace stress. And one of his hobbies is building a clock. Do you know? This is really true. Google this shit. Together with Elon Musk, I believe, who's another uh, fine specimen, he's obsessed, Jeff Bezos is obsessed with building a clock that will run for like thousands of years for until eternity. And he's like having industrial engineers build like 50 million dollars worth of corrosion proof grease or super lubricant or like to what end you can have a fucking clock in a mountain look no rich person has a requisite to philanthropy and i'm certainly no one to tell anyone how to st spend their money but these things like building a clock that will run forever. Yeah, building a ship that will take us to Mars. At least even that has some sort of logical outcome. Because it will help the development of cheaper satellite rockets, if nothing else. And it's a good publicity stunt for Tesla's company. But this Jeff Bezos and this stupid clock, it's just like Wayland. He's like, I'm going to have a trillion dollar mission to go to an alien planet. And I also built an android in my image who will help me. But of course, David is all like, you said you made me in your image, father, but you will die and I will live on. And Wayland is like, Sh son of David and... Pour me some fucking tea. He's like this really deadbeat dad. Oh my god. <laughs> In Turkish there's this expression. It's like bir siktir git de çay koy ulan. Like fuck off and make me some tea. Like this you say to someone who's talking pointless shit. And <laughs> it's really like Wayland pulls this Bir siktir git çay koy move to David, which was really funny. And because of this, David has never seen love or compassion. So he becomes jilted. He becomes so evil, in fact, that he bio-nukes an advanced alien civilization to death. Talk about overkill. Yes, so in this film... By the way, I'm making spoilers all over the place, but I haven't warned you, but I don't really care. And I don't think you'd care either. So here we go. Spoilers. In this film, our characters come to a dead planet and they find David there from the first movie, his head sewn back together. And it turns out he's killed the entire planet. And he's also... Dabbled somewhat in genetic engineer. I fashioned myself something of a geneticist these days. And he's like creating these alternative xenomorph like things, which ultimately seem to become the alien in the first alien film. And he's become just overtly dark and evil. Which begs the question, in Prometheus, David and others stop the engineers from destroying Earth. If he was so cruel, why did he stop it? He could have just destroyed the Earth right away. Which kind of begs the possibility that maybe he doesn't want to kill humanity, but... He punished the engineers for some mysterious reason. I don't know. The engineers, by the way, all look like... What was the name of that actor? Uh, sorry. Oh, I should have remembered. Okay. The engineers look like fat clones of 
Will Ferrell that have been shaved. So he comes to this magical city and bombards it into oblivion and like uses the residue with the black goo alien material to create the first alien eggs which brings us to the creatures in this film okay there are these like this is the hollywood thing that when there's a new movie there has to be a new monster when there's a new jurassic park there needs to be a new dinosaur when there's a new alien there there needs to be a new xenomorph so it's like makes some models of cars and electronic shit gadgets but you know you could recycle the old creatures verbatim and i think in most films these would be more popular so in this film there are these neomorphs that don't erupt from the chest but they burst from the back or the mouth or something um I'm circumcised, okay? So whenever I'm having a bath, I can basically see the design of these neomorphs. They're awful. They really, I kid you not, look like a walking pale thing with the face of an uncircumcised dick. It's not even like Gigar was great at this, so... He could pull off this visual symbolism without it appearing to be bollocks, but the designers didn't do a good job here, and the neomorphs really look like circumcised penises with like teeth or something. And then there was a Tambalina alien. So what happens is David has somehow created the original alien eggs that you see in 1976 alien okay and he somehow this group of people land on the planet they get infected some of them die and he shelters the rest and he somehow leads one of them to this trap and like in literally two minutes a Tambelina alien emerges. Like first a face hugger comes at the guy. He dies. And in like 60 seconds. Continuous film time. His chest bursts. And like a little alien. Like this figure from a toy you know. Emerges from his chest. As if pushed upwards by an invisible platform don't ask me how it happens but yeah the music during that scene was unbelievable beautiful and that alone saved that scene from being ridiculous so yeah and, uh, let's see what the next episode will bring i don't know CG was used rather extensively in this film and in certain cases it shows. I mean, there are these cat-sized creatures whose power seems to defy the laws of physics. They grow in minutes. They're like Pokemon. One of the suspense, part of the reasons the suspense of the old alien films was so effective was that time was passing between incidents you know Kane was impregnated by the facehugger the facehugger stayed there for nearly a day then a few days later he had a chest burster so on and so forth but now you know because audience knows about all this so the directors rush through everything it's like and it's like Pokemon come on I mean I've made a lot of critiques but once again uh I'll make one more critique, and that was David's art layer. <laughs> so David, because he's jilted or something, he's making all these drawings of the alien creatures that used to live on the engineer's planet. And 
the facehuggers or the proto-facehuggers or the neomorphs or whatever. But they're all so awful. Like, okay, I'm artistically trained and discerning, but really anyone can see this, that one of the supposed alien bug drawings that David has made is that of a Goliath beetle. And it's a badly drawn one at that. And then there's these some other things like it's just is this uh, the bedroom of a teenager? And then like David has labeled scientific names and and you can obviously see the, that the film designers don't know anything about science, don't know anything about nature illustration. I dare say they don't know anything about creature design the way the venerable bygone Hans Rudi Giger did. And you can see this stupid scribblings and it's like some fan movie. Hell, I can name you artists on DeviantArt that draw better than that. And it's a pity because uh, obviously Ridley Scott spent a lot of time and detail on all the props and something and they could have found a better artist. Heck, this is the name of the artist, okay? Google him. Walton Ford. He made these amazing and scary and sometimes violent paintings of animals in true 19th century naturalist tradition. Why didn't they commission him to make one painting? That would have been a far better artwork for this David. And then there's this other funny thing, which is like, David is like this stereotypical educated British twat. And Walter, the good android, is like the American guy. I'm afraid, Ken, I'm afraid I can't let you do that, mate. You've been scaring people off. Folks get worried, you know, like, and then they have this kind of, and David's like, why serve in paradise if not be a king in hell? And then they have this Matrix style fight and plot twist. At the end, you see that David has replaced Walter somehow and he's become the bad guy. And okay, two scenes were really like saddening for me. One of them was the birth of the backburster or whatever from the second guy that caught the infection and it just came like a piece of vomit and that was like perfectly executed, real like solid gore, riveting, scary movie gore and it was really disturbing because a few nights before, my wife had low blood sugar, hit her head on the bathroom floor and vomited. And the vomit came in the exact way. It's like a kind of arm tick projectile fluid. But in this film, it was exactly like that. So it comes from his mouth and it's like one sudden ghastly worm thing. And it really got me scared. And also, okay, in this film, it really got a reaction out of me. So you should chalk this up in the kudos part for the film and the filmmakers. So the colony ship is carrying 2,000 frozen people. And at the end, unfortunately, the evil David takes control of the ship and he plays Wagner and you can see that he's hell-bent on infecting all these people with these <clears throat> really ghastly mutating alien things. And it's a bit like that other 1990s British horror film Event Horizon that he's gonna create hell there. 
and it's really sad and scary you know i mean maybe i'm getting older you know marriage family shit i mean i used to be far more nonchalant but now it just brings me a pang of sadness that an evil character is going to have his way with blameless people i somehow really empathized for that and it filled me with vindictive fury hatred and repulsion i i guess this is the way i'm in life but when it's innocent people at the hand of a deliberate sadist ooh i just want to bring down the wrath of god on top of him anyways that's an emotional response <clears throat> mind you the critiques and you know the shading is the fun part but really this is a great film as i told before the soundtrack is great the production design is great the city of the dead is unfucking believable the city of dead will ferrell shaven type aliens is extremely well designed and filmed the lightning the architecture the strange statues you want to go deeper into that city you're curious about what lurks in the corner or what that building is for what the engineers were doing there you know especially connected to the soundtrack which you can find in the links it's a beautiful soundtrack it's like phew, it really is a strike in the artery for me um, it really had this kind of surreal world building illuminated charm that not many other films have in this day and age which brings us to some other neat things about this series so if you watch any youtube movie or any thing about the alien franchise in general these days you will see that the comments are full of theories like why did david kill who were these aliens what was in that room what was in that was this kind of endless theorizing counter theorizing and I think this is a great thing about films these days. It's notoriously easy to do actually. And the worst example of that was in the early 2000s. That fuck all series lost. Oh, what's behind the hatch? What's the dark smoke? Oh my God, I'm so excited. No, 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 man. Like in the early 2000s, it was full of people talking about this shit nonstop week after week. I never watched an episode of it. But it showed me that vague world building done purposefully really draws people in. You you know, you really add a little mystery to the mix. And Alien Covenant and now looking back Prometheus are good examples of this. Even though the overall picture is still a bit inconsistent and yeah you do see the places people have made up as they went but hey still it's a good like get the cranks turning kind of horror world building which i think ridley scott is in engaging in with no small amount of relish and this is where i want to go back to symbolism okay the deliberate transposition of mystery in art that was a movement in the late mid to late 19th century to the uh, let's say 1920s symbolism was a mainly european and russian and there's a lot of symbolist art online these days especially on tumblr with these kind of weird women's incomprehensible rituals strange characters and monsters done in a really artful skilled and artistic way too i mean some famous symbolist work gustav klimt 
could be considered to be a symbolist. Odilon, Redon had some really strange and eerie landscapes. E this dazzling and incomprehensible cyclops, for example. And other painters like Elihu Vedder and something. So these guys deliberately created enchanting and mysterious landscapes. Did not explain them. And drew the weavers in to a world of magical possibility. And for a while it was like really where the growing edge of art itself was. Then uh, they got too entangled in mythology. They began to put in these obvious connections like a British surreal sculpture, for example, shows this like cool woman with rays or tentacles coming out of her head and it's called the Mysteriarch and it's a great sculpture but in those later days you could see it the effect is wearing a bit thin and the symbolist artists are like, like whoa this really mythological allegory cool woman and it's kind of turning into heavy metal magazine into a bit which is not bad either, but it's growing further away from mystery and it's becoming expectable mystery. Expectable and acceptable mystery. So there goes symbolism. So you could see that with these films, Ridley Scott is trying to do the same with a techno-scientific symbolist narrative world symbol and mystery construction and he's doing it quite well i think this is why the stupid plot holes don't disturb me as much because i mean here's a film crew of dozens of people maybe hundreds of people using millions of dollars to turn a profit from a market of millions of viewers worldwide so you know you can expect the film to be trapped in some sort of logical rigid structure like i think if the god of hollywood came to ridley scott and he said ridley scott and ridley scott says yes yeah, scott i says what do you want to do ridley scott and He's like, I want to make alien mysteries, God. And he's like, all right, read this cut. Here you go. Hundred trillion dollars. No questions asked. Just do as you will, will, will. And then read this cut, I believe, would dispense with this kind of plot details or even characters altogether. And he would film this kind of... Tarkovsky style dreamy scenes smoky merging into one another a bit like Eraserhead or some of David Cronenberg's earlier films I think this is what Ridley Scott wants to do but he's kind of stuck in this logical stories and likable characters loop because hey you're making a film for a market which tells us something about our, our society. You know, they say that the age of reason is over or whatever, but people this day and age are so stuck in a cycle of logical reasons, characters and outcomes that mass audiences cannot even conceptualize a fantasy without characters logic and a logical plot i think it's really telling in in a hundred years these plot structures are gonna be a telling trace of our civilization driven by forced reason unable to escape and unable to let go 
of the conventions of character, consequence and cause. And you know, if you dispose of these scriptures, you can still make movies, no one's stopping you, but few people will get to say it. People will actually get angry because they can't understand the story. So I think Ridley Scott is going through this gauntlet. But at the end, he's still putting some of these primal details in there, which is, I think, really commendable and respectable. One final, like, undeniable link that connects symbolism to this is this one painting. Isle of the Dead by Arnold Böcklin in 1886. And one of the set pieces in Alien Covenant is modeled exactly after this painting. I knew this painting before watching the movie and when I saw the scene, everything fit into place and everything I've been telling you for the past 20 minutes, I had an understanding. I had an epiphany. And... Okay, now I'm going to show you the painting, Isle of the Dead. So if you want, look at your YouTube screens in 3, 2, 1. Amazing, isn't it? Another painting of the symbolist school by Elihu Vedder called the questioner of the Sphinx painted in 1836 I think also captures a lot of the mood and setting and the feeling of this film and Prometheus even though it's not directly related to it and I'm gonna show you that too are you ready to look at the screen okay here we go Okay. So there you go people. That was my opinion on the whole alien franchise, alien covenant, Prometheus, symbolism and the like. I hope you enjoyed it and as always please like amid this video, share this video. And what do you think about alien Prometheus? Alien Covenant, what are your theories about the, the androids, the engineers? Please, let's talk about them in the comment section. I always answer comments. So, there. And also, look deeper into symbolism. That's a very rich and underappreciated body of work these days and ages. Sometimes... We all need a sense of mystery in our lives, no matter how rooted we remain in reason, cause and consequence. Thanks and have a nice day.